Well, thank you to the Philosophical Film Festival for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and to rewatch Lang Kree with all of you. It's actually the first time I've seen it in a cinema, so it's a pretty special experience for me as well. Um, so as we heard in the introduction, Denis' 2004 film Lang Kree is loosely based on a text by Jean-Luc Nancy of the same name, which interweaves an autobiographical account of his experience undergoing a heart transplant with a meditation on the figure of a foreigner. So my talk tonight will trace the dialogue between the French filmmaker Claude Denis and the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy to think about the ways this mutually informing encounter between film and philosophy asks us to think differently about the body, foreignness, listening, and also the ethics of spectatorship. So to do so, I will begin not with L'Intrue, actually, but with um, Denis' most celebrated film, which is Beau Travail. So Denis' 1999 film, Beau Travail, marks the beginning of the dialogue between the filmmaker and the philosopher. So for those who haven't seen the film, Beau Travail explores the French Foreign Legion. A reimagining of Herman Melville's novella, Billy Budd, it tells a story of an internal conflict within the Legion against the backdrop of the post-colonial landscape of Djibouti. The film inspired Nancy to write an article for the quarterly magazine, Bakhelm, where he frames both Ravai as, quote, a philosophical film. For Nancy, the film is not just a provocation for his own philosophical thought, but another form of thinking in its own right. So through Denis' affirmation of the image, and this is a non-figurative, non-representational image, Beautravail reflects on the possibility of art beyond or after religion. Later that year, uh, Nancy wrote on Denis' Trouble Every Day, which you can see here, um, and exploring how the cannibalistic film registers what he says is the truth of the body, so this idea of bodily integrity being mere illusion um, through its shattering of the filmic image. For Nancy, the film figures touch at its limit point, the shaky threshold between the kiss and the bite, intimate contact and destruction. So whether through the affirmation of the image or its shattering, Nancy exposes the way Denise films articulate a kind of cinematic thinking. So while Nancy focuses on the visual here and on the image, I'm going to try to trace out um, another link through the auditory between these two thinkers. So in response to Nancy's writings, Denis made two films directly inspired by his work. So the first is Vers Nancy. It's a short film featuring Nancy in conversation with one of his students, um, also an immigrant, um, about this question of foreignness, borders, and other themes that we see return in L'Intrue as well. So foreignness is, of course, a long-standing concern in Denis' filmmaking. Beau Travail was, in fact, a commission on the theme of foreignness for the Franco-German channel Arte. And in part, this stems from Denis' uh, own biographical uh, background. So as the daughter of a French colonial administrator, her childhood from about 1948 to 1962 was spent in the then French colonies of sub-Saharan Africa, a subject she turned to for her first feature, Chocolat. So while there, Denis was a foreigner as well as an embodiment of white colonial presence, Denis has also spoken of the feeling of foreignness upon her return home to France during the period of decolonization. So this double sense of foreignness imbues the narratives of Denis' films, often from a post-colonial perspective. Her films allow foreignness to guide film form, creating an experience of defamiliarization for the spectator by denying us anchoring coordinates. In doing so, Denise films offer us encounters with foreignness in ways that do not fix or categorize, but instead render strange our relation to difference. So as we will discuss, uh, these themes return in Denise Nightcru, which, like the film La Blessure, takes its inspiration from Nancy's book, published in 2000. 
So in the intruder according to Claire Denis, Nancy describes Denis' own version of l'intrus not as an adaptation, but instead as a cinematic adoption of his philosophical text. So he's emphasizing that the lines of affiliation between film and text are extra natural, natural uh, without evidence or kinship. So uh, this description gets to the heart of Nalsi's reading of the film, and we can discuss that later. And it also underscores the kind of development of the exchange between Nalsi um, as it's been moving from kind of responses to each other's work to a direct um, influence and intrusion upon each other's work, a self-reflexive dialogue between them. So following L'Intru, Denis and Nancy work together on a publication uh, and a film on the choreographer Mathilde Meunier, and they also continue to collaborate uh, at the European Graduate School um, in lectures and seminars. So this collaborative dialogue, which now spans over two decades, has invited scholarly attention, particularly around the role of touch and the body across Nancy's philosophy and Denise's cinema. In my own research and what I wish to do today, it's to trace a central yet unexplored connection between the two thinkers, a shared consideration of silence and listening. As a call to listen, Denis's use of silence in L'Intru makes palpable the intrusion of foreignness central to Nancy's text. So through a focus on his experience undergoing a heart transplant, Nancy's L'Intru explores the intrusion of the foreign within the body and by extension within the body politic. He describes the illness, operation, and subsequent medical treatments as a series of intrusions that destabilize the coherence of both his body and his identity. In detailing his body's exposure to another's, another heart, Nancy writes, in me there is the intrus and I become foreign to myself. So for Nancy, the experience of the heart transplant only foregrounds the foreignness that has always existed, the constitutive foreignness within the self. This relation with foreignness opens up the ethical dimensions of Nalsi's text. At the crux of the text is an ethical injunction to preserve the experience of intrusion, this relation with foreignness, rather than attempting to master or assimilate it. For intrusion is the human condition for Nalsi. So as Nalsi writes, there must be something of the intru in the stranger Otherwise, the stranger would lose its strangeness. If he already has the right to enter and remain, if he is awaited and received without any part of him being unexpected or unwelcome, he is no longer the stranger. It is thus neither logically acceptable nor ethically admissible to exclude all intrusion in the coming of the stranger or the foreign. So in this opening passage, Nancy stresses that an ethical relation towards the foreign requires not only a recognition of, but a decision to exist with foreignness, to sit with the destabilizing discomfort of its intrusion. Rather than neutralizing or absorbing difference by making the foreign familiar, a Nancyan ethical relation necessitates its preservation. So as Denis herself echoes in an interview, intrusion is always brutal. There's no such thing as a gentle intrusion. In Lectru, she translates these themes on the level of both narrative and film form. <coughs> Premiered at the Venice Film Festival in 2004, the film traces the journey of Louis Trebor, played by Michel Subor, an aging Frenchman with a heart condition who lives alone with his two dogs in the Jura Mountains near the French-Swiss border. L'Intru features many of Denis' long-standing collaborators, actors Grégoire Collin, Michel Thibault, and Béatrice Dahl, cinematographer Agnès de Godard, and composer Stuart A. Staples of the band Tindersticks. Through an elliptical narrative structure and dreamlike sequencing, the film follows Trébor from the Jura Mountains to Geneva, 
to South Korea and Tahiti as he undergoes a black market heart transplant operation and attempts to reunite with his estranged son. In receiving a foreign heart and crossing borders as a foreigner, the figure of Trebov embodies both dimensions of the intrusion of the foreign detailed in Nossi's text. In his essay on Denis's film, Nossi considers how intrusion unsettles coherent assumptions of identity and naturalness, this time less through focus on the body and more through focus on kinship, specifically the lines of filiation between father and son. In the film, Trebel abandons one son in search of the other. The first son, the film not so subtly implies, was murdered for his heart, which Trebel's body later rejects. The estranged son, on the other hand, is replaced by a stand-in who bears no biological relation. While Nossi's analysis centers on kinship, other types of border crossings and intrusions permeate the film's narrative. So one, the setting of the film at the front where uh, customs officers halt the crossing of illegal goods and illegal immigrants, the organ trafficking, uh, we can also think of the passports and identity cards that are repeatedly featured in the film, Trebel's travels to the former French Polynesian islands, which invokes the legacy of colonialism, and also trespassing strangers, such as a vagabond girl who enters Trebel's home and the Russian woman who follows Trebel to Tahiti. And these figures often kind of intrude upon the text, so disappearing and appearing at the same time. It is through the use of silence and the way it engages the spectator on an oral level that the film registers these encounters with foreignness and mobilizes the ethics implicit in Nancy's Vectru as well as in his text, listening, as we will talk about a bit later. So as, as you will have noticed in tonight's screening, dialogue is sparse in L'Intrude. This is a defining feature of Denis's audiovisual style. A form of cinematic silence, minimal dialogue is typically associated with the filmmaker's privileging of ellipses and opacity over explanation and legibility a component of what film scholar Martin Bonnier has called Denis' aesthetics of the unsaid. Denis' films are known for eschewing conventions of plotline and narration in a way that challenges the psychological legibility of characters and often leaves narrative events un un unexplained. Instead, her films privilege the sensuous textures of image and sound, attending to the materiality of the body, both on screen and off. So on screen, bodies are often captured through fragmentary close-up. A handheld camera lingers on textural detail, water lapping against bare skin here. Off screen, this focus on materiality draws the spectator's awareness to their own embodied position. Denise's style reminds us that we are not just eyes gazing at the screen, nor just a brain directed towards narrative comprehension, as film theory sometimes likes to pretend but rather a living, breathing body engaged in a multi-sensory experience. As opposed to a negation of dialogue, Denis' minimal dialogue is better understood as an affirmation of cinematic silence, and that's one of my key proposals here. This is not to say that there is no sound, for Denis' filmic worlds are alive with sonic materialities. In the composition of film sound, which typically obeys a hierarchy of dialogue, then music, and finally sound effects, quieting one element amplifies another. In L'Entre, Denis deploys a formal strategy I would like to call tonal silence, which both withholds dialogue and magnifies sound effects to direct attention to the materiality of film sound. Listening to these sonic materialities, I argue, presents us with a different experience of embodiment, one which foregrounds the intrusion of foreignness. The cinematic medium has a unique capacity to make us feel silence, to amplify its affective and often destabilizing power. We experience cinematic silence not as an absence, but as a heightened listening, a listening that is both directed towards the film and refracted back to the spectator. 
In a short text titled Listening, first published in 2002, Nancy makes a conceptual distinction between what he calls listening, écouter, and hearing, entendre, as two different yet coexisting modes of perception and reception. As Nancy argues, hearing aims towards intelligibility or signification. It's all about understanding. Listening, on the other hand, orients towards sense beyond signification. So this is the materiality of listening as well as the materiality of film sound itself. Nancy makes a connection between silence and listening as well. Silence in Nancy's formulation is neither absence nor privation, but a call to listen. So he writes, silence in fact was here be understood, s'entendre, heard, not as a privation, but as an arrangement of resonance. A little or even exactly is when in a perfect condition of silence, you hear your own body resonate, your own breath, your heart, and all its resounding cave. So for Nancy, silence not only leads us to listen attentively for the arrival of sound, but also forces us to listen to the body as resonance chamber, to listen to ourselves listen. Silence, in other words, invokes listening at its most heightened state. So here we might think of the anecdote of John Cage's visit to an anechoic chamber, an experience uh, that reportedly inspired uh, his silent piece, four minutes and 33 seconds. And in this chamber's artificial condition of silence, Cage describes how he heard two sounds, which the sound engineer later confirmed to be the internal sounds of Cage's own body, the hum of his nervous system, and the low pulsing beat of blood circulating through the heart. Like Nancy's resonance chamber, Cage's act of listening to silence stages an auscultation of the body as foreign. In hearing his own internal bodily sounds outside himself, Cage experiences the sonorous intrusion of his now disembodied heart. Denise Lintrude similarly connects the experience of listening to silence with the intrusion of foreignness. If you recall the film Central Ellipses, the omission of Trebel's heart transplant surgery. So this functions as a structuring absence within the film. In its place, we get a dreamlike sequence which interlaces the intrusion of a stranger with the intrusion of bodily boundaries. Bookended by shots of Trebel and hotel beds anticipating and recovering from the surgery, this sequence unravels like a delirious nightmare a hallucinatory scene that further signals the film's abandonment of narrative logic. And I'll try to play the clip here.
So by withholding dialogue or semantic sense, tonal silence in this sequence shifts the spectator away from a hearing as merely understanding and towards more expansive listening. With no dialogue to guide or structure our perception, we listen to ambient sounds of movement, bodies, human and canine, against the glacial landscape. The sequence's tonal silence magnifies textural detail as the vagabond girl scrapes snow from the ice her breathing audible as she uncovers the face of a human body tra trapped beneath the surface. So we follow the vagabond girl as she breaks into Trebov's abandoned home in the Jura Mountains, followed by his two dogs. The camera lingers in close-up on the girl's skin as she bathes herself in a plastic tub. We listen attentively for the arrival of sound, focusing in on the densely textured soundscape, water lapping and flowing as it comes into contact with her exposed body. The girl's nearly inaudible breathing intermingles with the sound of Trebel's dogs, panting and whining beside her. Her silence and the growing unease signaled by the sound of the dogs intensifies this call to listen. As Nasi writes in his response to the film, Dogs and women seem to share a presentiment of intrusion in the film. The claustrophobic intimacy of the scene of domestic intrusion then shifts abruptly to an image of a glacial landscape. The sound of howling wolves begins to build in the distance. A disorienting close-up erupts into the frame. Again, we listen to the ambient sounds of movement, footsteps, and heavy breathing as two men struggle across the landscape, carrying a limp body wrapped in blood-stained cloth. As the camera shakily tracks along the surface of the ice, the sound of howling wolves mingles with the wailing siren and the discordant sound of a film score, its single reverberating note. So the composer Stuart A. Staples I reportedly refused to provide a melody for the film and instead wanted to drill the film, and you can kind of see that repetition sonic repetition across the film. The sequence's ambient sounds are too loud and no longer naturalistic. Instead, they disorient and dislocate the spectator. The camera focuses, revealing an arresting image of a blood-red heart on the white snow. As the camera circles back to the bloody body, we recognize the face of the vagabond girl. The sequence concludes with a shot of Trebov, waking in a darkened hotel room. The tonal silence in the sequence parallels and makes palpable the intrusion of Trebov's own bodily boundaries, the removal of his own heart and the insertion of a foreign one. By staging an intrusion of the body and focusing in on the disembodied heart, the sequence depicts the self-estrangement experienced by Trebov and Jean-Luc Nancy in the aftermath of undergoing a heart transplant. The body rendered strange, the foreignness within, is inscribed within this haptic image of the disembodied heart. Trebel's experience of foreignness within his own body is refracted onto that of the spectator. Listening to these sonic materialities produces a heightened awareness of our own embodied spectatorial position, particularly as all these sounds evoke bodily contact. They refract our listening back to us with the dialogue withheld and listen to ourselves listen. So there, this reflexive listening draws attention to the body's resonance chamber. For Nancy, to listen means being in resonance. So this is when internally, internal bodily sounds and the emissions produced in the act of listening resonate elsewhere only to come back to the body as if transformed through external contact. Here we can think of the phenomenon of the echo, where we hear our own voice as if it is foreign to us. Through listening then, the body of the spectator becomes foreign, a space where inside and outside intermingle. So this looping movement of resonance, which is rendered palpable in silence, I argue, highlights both the foreignness within the self and the relationality of existence. As Nancy writes, existence is not about being with a capital B, but about being with. 
Listening to tonal silence in this sequence therefore not only echoes, but more importantly, registers the film's preoccupation with the intrusion of foreignness. Denis's cinematic thinking, in other words, helps to flesh out the material and ethical dimensions of Nancy's texts, listening and maitre. As a bodily intrusion of something other, the heart transplant destabilizes the notion of a stable, self-contained subject. Listening for Nancy attunes us to this intrusion of foreignness, setting the foundation for an ethics of embodied spectatorship that refuses to fix the foreign onto the other. So here I don't mean a normative understanding of ethics with its prescriptive rules and moral codes, but instead ethics as the, as the act of interrogating the self about its relationship to the other and to the world. By inviting us to listen to the body as resonance chamber, Denis' use of tonal silence calls attention to the spectator's disembodiment, the body is foreign. In doing so, Lentru denies the spectator a coherent body or stable self-contained subject position from which relations of mastery, projection, or assimilation could emerge. A Nancyan ethical relation proceeding from what, what we might call an ethics of listening posits neither a stable identity, coherent self, nor an unbridgeable alterity with a foreigner. Instead, an ethics of listening articulates a way of relating to self, other, and world that begins with the recognition of our own endlessly intruding foreignness. So to end with the words of Nancy, the entry is no other than me, myself, none other than man or woman himself, no other than the one, the same, always identical to itself, and yet that is never done with altering itself. Thank you. Precise and uh, subtle analysis. Uh, I, um, what I, I would like just uh, is just a little uh, thing that I would like to add to to to, to, like to, to make it into another proof that you are right. Uh, if I may say so. Uh, the, it is a sort of. Uh, uh, meteorological, atmospherical, cosmical field. Uh, wind, snow, water, fire, earth, uh, sky, uh, breeze, you know, elementary, elementary, this uh, the element, the, 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 the cosmic elements and the, the, the transformation of the intensity, you know, from fire to to, to, to snow and to ice, you know? and uh, to um, fog and, and, and so on. Yeah? So and this is the sort of texture of, uh, of the living thing, nature. You can call it that nature, but you don't need to call it that nature. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, like the, it's like if the film also made this, uh, this is typical of uh, Claire Denis, but I think maybe this is a, a, a masterpiece in a sense. Uh, displaced the, the, you know, the less uh, uh, um, uh, would call it uh, uh, perception molecular, mm. molecular perception. That is, uh, you, 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 this has, you, 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 um, you um, defer. What is defer in English? Andre. You undo, you undo, you undo the, the, the block, you undo the block, and then you find what stone, big stone, big stone, sand. So you can analyze the whole thing in this, in this idea of uh, finding the molecule. The mm -hmm. molecule, and what, what's more, in the, with, the, with the editing, with the editing, you can read in zigzag the film. 
that is, for example, the, the nudity you showed uh, there mm -hmm. uh, comes uh, after three, four, five more nudities before, and then you can uh, cross edit in your mind or in your uh, soul. I don't know. You get all these nudities and this uh, erotism of uh, materiality. You know? mm -hmm. So. I think what I'm saying is just what you said in another, another domain, you know, beyond, the, beyond, beyond the sound. But I think this is very, very important and it is a, a, a brilliant translation that uh, uh, Denis makes about this philosophical question you so well explained. So he, he goes beyond with images, with perception, with the old okay. Yeah, no, thank you for your question and, and or comment, interpretation. I think that's a really good one to kind of look at the elementary mo molecular <coughs> perception, and especially with her use of the close-up and tight framing across her work. It's very much about that kind of singularity of the material. Um, and I don't wish to completely disregard the visual because I do think that it works in tandem. Um, and I'm thinking also, which was really clear in the screening today, um, about the darkness of a lot of the scenes and the way that there's a similar kind of disorientation that I, I see going on in the use of sound effects and the minimal dialogue that dislocates the spectator from their kind of secure position. Um, so really being attuned to that kind of limits of visibility. Also the, the kind of relentless movement across across the film, um, again, is for me, participates in that uh, disorienting position and that kind of different perception towards the materiality, because materiality and movement has a different texture. Thank you. Uh, I have some uh, questions. Uh, uh, the, the film left me with a lot of questions, <laughs> open, open, open questions, and uh, it's uh, related to the story actually. Uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, I, I like your interpretation about the body and uh, the intrusion, the foreignness, but uh, what I didn't understand uh, was. Uh, uh, or uh, I try to understand, but I'm not sure uh, about this uh, part of the story with the, you said uh, the background. Mm. Uh, so uh, was this uh, like uh, uh, something that really happened, or was this just uh, his imagination? Because uh, before that, uh, he seemed to have uh, some uh, uh, some visions, like uh, uh, guilty consciousness about uh, him having, a, uh, having a, a foreign heart in his body and uh, doing it in this illegal way. So was this because uh, he had also this uh, vision of him uh, being dragged uh, uh, in the snow by this uh, Ukrainian or Russian girl? And uh, was this also another vision just like uh, because I guess that that part with the dragging of the body was also a vision, mm. an imagination. And, uh, and also the part where he was uh, uh, killing, you know, there were very short sequences yeah. you couldn't even uh, really see uh, if he really did, but uh, that was like a, uh, like a hint that, he's, uh, that he was, I maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Mm -hmm that he was some kind of former spy, KGB spy, and, uh, but who were the, those people uh, that he killed? Uh, were they real threat to him, or were they just uh, 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 lost uh, uh, refugees who were trying to go somewhere else in Europe? And uh, so these were the questions I'm uh, not sure about. And mm -hmm. just one more comment sure. about the music. Uh, it, uh, it was really beautiful and I really liked the soundtrack. Uh, it reminded me something like a, uh, like Dead Man from uh, 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 the, the soundtrack uh, uh, from Dead Man from Jarmusch. Mm -hmm. And uh, a Dario Argento Tangerine uh, Dream uh, uh, soundtracks. Yeah, yeah.
No, thank you for those questions. I, I fear that I won't be able to give a straight answer because I think they're, they're purposely left ambiguous and elliptical. Um, but what I, what I think is interesting about these different groups of foreigners is that it, it kind of stages the different kinds of foreignness and strangeness and that kind of ethical demand that is different based on whether it's a refugee or whether it's these hunters or poachers that are going to kill people for their hearts for the black market, market heart transplant operation. So I, I feel like there's, if, I, I don't think I can give you a straight answer over, yeah, I think it's on purpose for sure, but I think in the way that there are these different levels of strangeness and foreignness, it brings out the kind of ethical nuances of the injunction, the quote that I put up on screen, um, because again, there's there's different kinds of foreigners and those, the kind of relationship between them, I think is key to the film. But in terms of whether they're dream sequences or not, um, I think the, the clip that I just showed preceding that, there's a kind of shift in his eye line and then also his ear that suggests that he's almost anticipating the listening, um, but that also kind of informs this idea that it's actually a, a dream sequence. So I would say that they're more in a psychological, um, affective relationship to the text rather than um, a specific, realistic interpretation of it. Um, as for the, the soundtrack, I think, yeah, I think you're totally right in those comparisons. I think that's great. Um, so yeah, Claire Denis works with Stuart A. Staples and Tinder Six on almost all of her films. So there, there is a kind of, just as Nancy and Denis have a kind of collaborative going on, there's definitely that relationship between Stuart A. Staples and Denis too. So he, he actually works in the editing room um, with, with the editor and his kind of scoring of it is very much in line with Denis' own thinking. I have the feeling that I heard it somewhere before where I was wondering, where, where, do, I, yeah. where do I know this uh, music from? Uh, where the, what uh, does it remind me of all the time? Well, thank you. So I think we are finishing in here. Um, thank you, Hannah, for coming to Macedonia and coming to the Philosophical Film Festival. Вечер лайк е пука на сите има меѓу ез вечер во десетки четири спит со шампа джес три утре почнува вечерите на кратки филмови утре и за утре и утре вечер исто така има и еден бразилски филм но ајде види кој што делал официјалната селекција на долговетрени филмови кој што толку зборува за бразилски филмови и генерации ова време на субјективни уметници кои што се борат преку естетиката за политика или за едно подобро Ви благодарам што присуствувате на проекцијата и се гледам се надам може би вечера. Благодарам.